it's not uh, 388, it's 338. And uh, then, then you'll find it there. Probably want to go sing it right now, but uh, we're not going to do that. Now, if you would, uh, if you think you can get away with it, <clears throat> they're having uh, ice cream uh, in back with the kids, so um, you can go back there if you'd like to. But I'm warning you that if you do that, um, and that means that you want to become a teacher uh, back there. So uh, go ahead. Go ahead and do it. I dare you. And uh, that would be good. We've had some people volunteer for the, uh, the teaching of the twos. And uh, thank you for that. We uh, still need a couple of people to uh, prepare communion. And that's uh, not a difficult job. You don't have to, like, count the number of bread or anything. You just pour a few into the plate that looks like enough. And then you fill the cups. And you don't have to worry about, you know, filling them out of a bottle. You've got a, a cup filler thing. You pour the, wad, the, the juice in there. Then you just use your thumb. It's, it's real simple. I mean, your preacher can't do a lot of things, but I can do that. And uh, um, I was reminded of what I can't do uh, this week. Uh, uh, Steve Pratt and I went up to the farm, and uh, I'm building myself a, uh, a room so I won't freeze to death uh, during uh, uh, deer hunting like I did last year. And, um, and it was so funny um, Tim Wolbert volunteered to uh, loan me a, uh, a drill because he thought I could use it. And uh, Steve's famous words to me was, now Bruce, we're to go up there. This isn't a case where I do all the work and you just stand and watch me. You, no, you're going to do the work. And so we got there and he started explaining to me what it is that we were going to do. And then he'd say, do you understand what I'm saying? And I said, no. <laughs> and he said, do you think that you'll be able to do it? And I said, no. <laughs> he said, do you want me to explain it to you again? And I said, yes. So I spent most of my time watching, and it's, uh, it, so it's, it's done, and, uh, well, it's almost done. I gotta, I gotta put some uh, things of styrofoam on top yet, but uh, I'm, not, I'm not capable of doing many things, but uh, you can do the communion, I guarantee it. That, that's something that's, uh, that's simple. The other thing that I will tell you, in case you don't come back to the meeting and you grab one of my reports, I, I lied flat out right on it. I am so sorry. I, I didn't know until I came in here and was looking at the announcements that I lied. Um, I was trying to remember the amount that we'd given to Rafa House from my memory, which is always the wrong thing to do. Um, in this morning I saw it. It's 24,008 something. In my mind, I forgot the four, and I just put the eight next to it. So it says 28,000-something, and that's just a bald-faced lie. We did not give that much. If you would like to make me so I'm not a liar, uh, all you have to do is give Rafa House four grand more, and, uh, and then my report would be correct. So I just wanted to make sure that you covered that, because you're going to say, well, what's Bruce talking about? Um, so let's go to scripture because I know what we're talking about here. Would you join me please in a word of prayer. Father and God, we're thankful, so thankful today to come into your presence. We've all had weeks like our communion meditation talked about. But this morning, we can put all that aside and focus on your throne and the words that come from there. We hold in our hands a living book, 
one that is so remarkable and so different. But the holding of it isn't the key. Lord, it's when we come before your presence and we ask you to send the Holy Spirit into our hearts and into our minds and we allow him to come in that the real, magnificent miracle of you speaking to us occurs. This is a passage of scripture that we need to hear today. You designed this coming before any of us were even born. And so I pray that we would take advantage of our time together and intentionally invite your spirit to come into our being that we might hear about the wonderful grace of your son Jesus in whose name I pray, amen. If you have your Bibles, we'll turn please to Matthew chapter 13. We are in another parable that Jesus taught while he's in a boat sitting on the Sea of Galilee to the Jewish people on the shore. And uh, in these parables, we are seeing the great secrets of the kingdom, the mysteries of the pre present age, and the revelation of the forces and powers at work in the age which began with our Lord's coming and will end with his second coming. Today we're on the fourth parable. And it occupies just one verse. Verse 33. He spoke another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like leaven, which a woman took and hid in three pecks or measures of flour until it was all leavened. I called this message the strange case of the sneaky wife. And it's not that I was trying to find some kind of a tricky saying. This was undoubtedly the reaction of the people and the disciples who heard Jesus say this parable. When he told them that there was a woman who hid leaven in three measures of meal, they must have been shocked and would have immediately thought to themselves, what a dirty trick, what a sneaky thing to do. Now, we don't see it that way. And that's because we're not there, hearing it, living it. We don't understand the symbols as Jesus used them. So the purpose of our study this morning is to put ourselves back in that place and to hear this story as they heard it. When Jesus tells these seven secret mysteries of the kingdom, it is so unlike what we have arrived at in Christendom today. You hear it in our songs, you hear it when people talk to you, and like I said last week, this was such a predominant theory that really lost uh, the wind from its sails because of the First World War. But even today you hear people talking about the world is just going to get better and better and better. I, I don't know what world they're talking about. Any news that you listen to? Any expert that you read, any life that you live, it's not getting better and better. And for those of us with gray hair, we know life doesn't get better and better. It just gets achier and achier. And we wake up in the morning and we got a pain we didn't have yesterday. And we're thinking, well, how did I get that? Because it wasn't from something I did. I didn't do anything. I couldn't do anything because of the pain from the day before. 
This is probably the most misunderstood of all seven parables. Its meaning has been grossly uh, distorted into something entirely different from what our Lord intended. In most of the major commentaries on this passage, they throw out all kinds of rules that apply to interpretation. They don't take any notice of how Scripture uses a particular symbol because they are really trying to push their personal agenda. So they arrive at a meeting that's simply not here. This is the usual interpretation of this one, and you're probably familiar with it. The leaven is the gospel, and the woman is the church. And the church is to take this gospel and put it into the world of humanity, which is re represented by the three measures of meal. And the gospel quietly but surely will work away like leaven, like yeast and bread, until all of humanity is reached by the gospel of Jesus Christ and the entire world is changed. And then finally the kingdom of heaven will come in. That's the most popular version. And it is absolutely wrong. On the basis of that interpretation, men have thought at various times and places in the history of our world that the church was going to usher in the kingdom of God. That the gospel would so permeate the world, the affairs and the thinking of mankind, that Christianity would be a world religion accepted by every living soul on this planet. Now, if that were true, we might as well throw this away. Because that's not what this says. If the world's getting better and better and better, then Jesus was a liar. For here we are, 2,000 years after this was written. And Christianity isn't a world religion. In fact, there are more Muslims in our world than Christians. There are more non-churchgoers in our world than there are churchgoers. Jesus meant to tell us that the world was going to get better and better with the passing of time. Then either Jesus has failed or the church is God's worst idea ever or something's gone wrong. But if we're going to listen to this story as this crowd did and react as they did, then we're going to understand something that is going to be a great encouragement to us, I hope. First of all, let me remind you that the gospel was never given to save civilization from wreckage. The gospel is given to save human beings from the wreckage of civilization. Jesus didn't come to save this planet. Jesus came to save its inhabitants. But he wasn't forcing them. He was inviting them. Whosoever will may come. But the emphasis is on whosoever will. Okay, let's begin. Let's begin with the meal. Three pecks of flour. Meal means flour there. This is the central thing in the story. The woman and the leaven both did something to the three measures of meal. 
That's what our Lord's trying to get across. So the central question is, what does the meal, what does the flower represent? Well, this crowd of, uh, that Jesus is speaking to would know instantly what he's talking about. With their Judaistic background, their Old Testament uh, uh, training, their minds would flash back immediately to one of the first times they ever heard three measures of flour. It occurred in Genesis chapter 18, way back there. Abraham was sitting with his wife Sarah in his tent near the Oaks of Mamre. This was the beginnings, the foundation, the brainstorm for what would be called the meal offering in the Old Testament. The meal offering consisted of three measures of flour unleavened, no yeast at all. Now Abraham, the father of the faithful, the brightest star in the Hebrew sky, was sitting there enjoying the afternoon with his wife, and he looked out the door and he saw three strangers approaching, and he, he went to meet them because strangers were not common in that time. And anyone passing by was offered hospitality. So he welcomed them and offered them, according to the scripture, Genesis 18, verses 6 and 7, three measures of meal baked into bread, and Sarah made that in the tent while they were fellowshipping under the tree. During their conversation, it suddenly appeared, uh, uh, suddenly dawned on Abraham that these were no ordinary strangers. God was one of them. Now you see, he didn't send out a questionnaire or call ahead. Lots of times people are saying, you know, Bruce, I just soon you call before you come, drop by. God never had to do that. Oh, I'm not God. That's right. I forgot. So God just drops in with two angels. And we remember the story, God stayed back with Abraham, the two angels went down to Sodom and Gomorrah, but in the conversation, as they're talking, this was the beginning of the use of three measures of meal as a symbol. What did it mean? Well, it's clear that it became a symbol of the fellowship of God with his people and their fellowship with one another. So very early in the life of Jewish people, the three measures of meal became a picture of the people of God sharing a life and fellowship with Him. And when the Old Testament people offered the three measures of meal, they were describing in, in beautifully expressive language what was so precious in God's sight, and that is being one with Him and one with one another. God with his people, the life they shared with each other. So the measure in the parable, that peck is what the New American Standard says. I don't know what your non-inspired version does. Um, I mean the NIV. What, I, but the measure was the third part of an ephah. Therefore three, got my Vesterberg math going here third of an ephah, so three thirds is one. Isn't that right? Is that right? Nod your head if you're still awake. Okay. An ephah. This was the same amount offered as a meal offering by Gideon and by Hannah. And likewise, the quantity that was commanded for the meal offerings by Ezekiel in 45.24 common Old Testament symbol. Familiar to these Jews, they knew instantly what he meant. So in the New Testament, this fellowship, this bread, this meal offering refers to the church. Now, 1 Corinthians 1.9, Paul said to the church at Corinth, 
The key thing about their lives as Christians was what we call the fellowship of God. Paul says, God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. That's why fellowship is so important, my friends. That's why we have these things called potlucks, these things called get-togethers, these things where we just party down like, you know, Christian animals. We get so wild at our potlucks. Because I watch, you know, and we've got a big canister filled with water and a big canister filled with lemonade, and I know exactly where all of you are going. Right for the lemonade. Water is too bland for you. Because you are wild. God wants us that way. He wants us to be crazy about each other. He wants us to love and cherish the time that we put our knees under a table in fellowship because fellowship is so important with God. Fellowship was so important with God that do you know what? He turned himself into a human being to come to this planet just so he could fellowship with us. Now that's crazy. Because sometimes you don't even want to go fellowship with your relatives. I get that. Yeah, I get that. This is the, cre the key to that great letter in 1 Corinthians. It's what Christianity is all about. It's the sharing of the life of Jesus. We share his life. When John wrote uh, his first letter, he says, That which we have seen and heard we proclaim also to you, so that you may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son Jesus. Now let's look at the leaven. The disciples would quickly recognize its meaning. It's used all throughout the Old Testament, and it's always used the same way. Never once in Scripture, and put this down on a note, never once in Scripture... Is leaven ever used of anything good? Leaven is never good. And I heard on Christian radio, they're talking about the leaven of heaven. Oh, my word. Stop saying that in public. There is no sin in heaven. I know it, I know it rhymes. You know, but so is Brucey Goosey. But don't say that out loud. I hate that. They called me that in school. Man. Just because you can say it doesn't mean you ought to. Leaven. Never used as a symbol of anything good. And everyone in this crowd knew that. And so when they heard that this woman hid the leaven in the meal, she was doing something that God prohibited. She mingled a foreign element with the meal. She wanted to destroy the very meaning of this significant offering, for Scripture had taught them that the three measures of meal were to be unleavened. Now, remember in Egypt, before they left, that night when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, God said to Moses, tell the people, get out your flashlights, get out your, you know, battery-operated uh, uh, spotlights, whatever it's going to take, and I want you to go through the entire house. There cannot be one speck of leaven in your home. I want it all gone. All of it. Because we're doing something holy. We're doing something memorable. You're going to sacrifice a lamb and you're going to put its blood over the doors, uh, uh, the header and, and down the post, side post, and over the entryway. No leaven in your home. In the New Testament, you find five distinct usages of leaven. And they all mean something bad. Because never, ever in the scriptures does have leaven symbolize something good. It's, it stands for evil. And so Jesus speaks of leaven. Turn over to Matthew chapter 6. You're in 13, so just go back a couple of chapters. Matthew chapter 6. Oh, Matthew 16. Did I have that in your notes? Matthew 16. I'm sorry. I was seeing 28,000 again. Matthew chapter 16. 
And Jesus said to them, watch out and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And so we don't understand, misunderstand what he means. In Luke 12, Jesus comes right out and says, the leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy. Pretending to be something you're not. Pretending to have a status with God that you don't. Being a phony. We know what hypocrisy is. That's the leaven of the Pharisees, hypocrisy. Then he also said in that same verse and on, he spoke about the leaven of the Sadducees. That's rationalism. The leaven of the Pharisees is hypocrisy. The leaven of the Sadducees was rationalism. Their idea was life consists only what you can taste and see and touch and smell and hear and think about. There, there's nothing beyond. The Sadducees did not believe in a resurrection. They did not believe in eternal life. They did not believe in a home in glory. They did not believe in heaven. They, and, and because they didn't believe in a life after this, that was why they were sad, you see. Yeah, that'll sink in. Yeah. Sadducees, you can always remember what the Sadducees stood for. They were sad, you see. Then he spoke about the leaven of the Herodians, and that's in Mark chapter 8. The followers of King Herod, their leaven was materialism. They said, man, it is what, the, 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 what we can hold in our hand, what we can possess in our being. If you are wealthy and powerful, then you've got great value. Man, your life is worth something. If you can acquire wealth and power, then you have got the secret of life. And we got so many today following the philosophy of the Herodians. Jesus says that's evil. That's not the way you properly measure manhood or the value of a life. And then the other two uses of leaven are given by Paul. One is in 1 Corinthians 5, verses 6 through 8. He says that sexual immorality is leaven within the church. Sexual immorality. And in Galatians 5, 9, he says that legalism is leaven within the church. Now let me ask you a question. Has not the devil injected those five leavens in the church today? Hypocrisy, rationalism, materialism, immorality, and legalism. They're in the church, aren't they? And Jesus said through his holy word, we are to beware of them. So leaven, obviously, is anything that disintegrates, breaks up, corrupts, causes a puffed up, swollen condition, destroys honesty, obscures reality. That's what yeast does when you put it into bread. It changes it. And it, we like bread. We love to have our yeast in bread. We don't want to have yeast in our church. Okay? Now we come to the last symbol and the key question. Here we've got these two elements. The fellowship of God's people that Jesus looked down through the age. He saw as something so precious and important that he intended to introduce this into society. First, it was just for Jewish people. But he wanted to make this worldwide. Yeah. And he intended to introduce this as a good thing. And then this fivefold evil of level was, leaven was introduced into the fellowship. Who does that? Who is the woman? She represents the devil. Oh, yeah, I knew this part was coming. I said, God, really? I have to say this in front of everybody that's here? Yeah, the woman is the devil. <laughs> no, uh, you know, don't, uh, don't go too far into that, please, fellas, or your life at home this afternoon will be miserable. All right? 
Look again at Matthew 13, 33. And you're going to see, first of all, this was a deliberate act. A woman took. It wasn't done accidentally. She took this. It wasn't done by chance, it was done by choice. Satan knows what he's doing. He is out to deliberately sabotage the work of God. Now, second of all, notice it was a deceitful act. The Bible says she hid it. She's not doing this openly. She's not saying, hey, look, honey, I'm going to put this in there. Near the end of our Lord's ministry, he'll say that he has done nothing secretly. We're not out to hide the gospel. Don't try to make this leaven the gospel and these three loaves the world. We're not out to hide the gospel. We're out to make the gospel known. But it is Satan who's working beneath the surface. He is the master of deception, and so it is the deliberate act. She took it. It is a deceitful act. She hid it. And because it was deliberate and deceitful, it was a de devilish act. It doesn't take much to see the power of Satan behind all of this, putting in that leaven that is in something that's supposed to be unleavened. Now you say, but preacher, why was this a woman? Good question. The church is the bride of Christ. The bride of Christ is a woman. Now, I know that's not politically correct today. They don't even have that on our marriage licenses anymore. Some of you have got marriage licenses old enough to read husband and wife or bride and groom. They, they don't do that anymore. It and it. Together, still it. No gender. But God doesn't go that way. The bride of Christ is a woman. And what does the Bible talk about when it talks about a false church? A harlot. The bride is a woman. Satan is always imitating God, so he's got him a false church, and that false church isn't a woman, it's a harlot. He doesn't even give her that courtesy. Whenever you see a woman doing something wrong, something wicked in the Bible, well, turn over to Revelation chapter 2. Revelation chapter 2. And look at verse 20. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel, who calls herself a prophetess, and she teaches and leads my bondservants astray so that they commit acts of immorality and they eat things sacrificed to idols. Jezebel. Well, I think the word harlot is a little better. We don't want to be calling gals Jezebels. You see, this woman, this woman in the kitchen, this sneaky housewife is the bride of the devil. She represents the false church, not the true church. She's representing something that uh, is Satan's work to infiltrate the church with hypocrisy and rationalism and materialism and immorality and legalism. Now, I don't know if we've got any visitors here today that might be uh, thinking about a, a church let me just tell you that when you decide to find a church, it's a good idea to check out the kitchen. Find out who's in the kitchen. Don't go by taste test alone. Read the ingredients. See what's there because the devil wants to infiltrate and he does it so many ways. The devil doesn't have just one way to work. Remember, we've already looked through these parables. We talked about the parable of the sower, and there the, the devil catches away the seed. We talked about the parable of the tares, that he imitates the seed. Last week we talked about the mustard seed. He corrupts the seed. And in this parable today, he infiltrates the church. 
Satan is going to just keep trying to hide these things in the body of Christ. And we need to keep promoting the love of Jesus, not the leaven of Satan. Don't waste your time looking at other people's lives. <laughs> I don't want anybody leaving today saying, boy, that was a good sermon, preacher. I'm going to start looking for leaven in other people's lives. I'm not only going to go into the church's kitchen, I'm going into your kitchen to see if you got any leaven in there. Don't do that. Make sure these five kinds of leaven are not in your life, okay? Let's start there, your own life. Amazing that our Lord could look down the quarter of time and see how something good Satan made something bad. Every invention that has ever come down the pike is good for two things. It can be for good or it can be for bad. And sometimes at the same time. Any of you that are on certain medications, you run into this problem all the time. A doctor prescribes a certain medication for you to help. But it also hurts. You know, all ibuprofen is so good for pain, helps to reduce swelling, but you know, every pill you take that accumulates in your body works to destroy your liver. We're prescribed things that are supposed to help us, and they discover they do something else. Now we're trying to get back to the holistic things. Melatonin, so you can sleep nights. And I've told people for years, just get some of my CDs. Pop them in beside your bed, boom, works. Especially if you hear it more than once. Jesus knew that the church was going to struggle. That the church wasn't going to be the major player. That the church wasn't going to occupy the world. But what he also knew was that every single person that comes in contact with the amazing, wonderful, unimaginable power of Jesus Christ can transform darkness into light, sorrow into joy, and bondage into freedom. So let's stand and sing our final song today. And remember, it's not your goodness that's going to get you into glory, but the wonderful grace of Jesus. 338.